Despite the evil and debauchery that thrived within the Carino Empire, there was one man of great valor, a warrior who personified high ideals and upheld moral principles. His was a soul steadfast, remembered by history as an unequaled swordmaster and loyal guardian of House Atreides. But what is the prize of such noble effort? A man distilled and doomed through countless artificial lives to suffer the mental anguish of unlocking a fractured psyche, to relive the painful moments of his death time and time again. This is the tale of Duncan Idaho and the countless lives he's given in humanity's service. Duncan Idaho's early life is one shadowed by oppressive cruelty. He and his sister grew up on Getty Prime, the capital world and ancestral homeland of House Harkonnen. Known for their brutality, their disregard for human life, and twisted pleasure, existing beneath the Harkonnens was grim. Under torment and torture, Duncan's sister was slain by their agents. This too, would likely have been his own fate if not for the intervention of those loyal to the old duke of House Atreides, Leto's father and Paul's grandfather. The feud between these two houses goes far back into memory, and though not explicitly stated, it's easy to guess Idaho was freed from enslavement during an Atreides raid or as terms of an agreement brokered between houses. Regardless, Duncan's youth taught him caution. Wariness is reserved for House Atreides. Shortly after coming into their service, however, the young man is astonished at the old duke's differences. Poised, compassionate, regal, inspiring, all the aspects of humanity bereft in House Harkonnen. For the old duke's mercy and compassion, emotions Idaho had never experienced, the man pledges his undying loyalty to House Atreides. It's this word, loyalty, that becomes the cornerstone of Duncan's character. As he matures, Idaho manifests a code of honor, truthfulness, and constancy for which he is forever known. He also grows into a handsome man whose charisma sways both warriors and court ladies. Soon, he leaves the court on planet Caladan to receive military training on Ginaz. The world of Ginaz is famous for its sword masters. Unparalleled in combat, even against the Pranabindu arts of the Bene Gesserit and the savagery of House Carino's infamous Sardaukar, the Ginaz sword masters are sought the Imperium over for their knowledge and martial prowess. Here, Duncan Idaho receives rigorous training that molds him into a deadly soldier and shapes his impressionable character. Discipline, honor, finesse, all learned on Ginaz under Atreides' auspices. Idaho can only pay for this great change in fortune with his eternal servitude to the old duke's family. At some point in time, an incident breaks out between House Ginaz and another lesser house in the ongoing War of Assassins. This is merely a proxy conflict between great houses such as the Atreides, Harkonnen, and Carino that opens violence on the planet Grumman. Here is Duncan's medal first tested. He's sparred in training grounds, but never has he drawn blood. As an older, drunken Idaho reveals to the Lady Jessica Atreides, my sword was first blooded on Grumman, killed more than 300 men for the Duke. Clearly, even at a young age and green in combat, Duncan has few peers beyond his Ginaz masters. He returns to the Atreides court on Caladan and serves as retainer and swordmaster, responsible for training house guard and soldiers in Ginaz ways. When the old duke passes and Leto assumes leadership of the house, Duncan renews his oaths, attracted by Leto's charisma and impassioned presence. His employment and close association with the duke develops into a strong relationship, but one that is strained by the Bene Gesserit concubine to whom Leto has given his heart. Jessica represents the secretive order, whose machinations are unknown, a source of discord and potential danger to the Duke. Duncan's vigilance carries suspicion for Jessica, but he can't deny her beauty and a private affection toward her 
buds as the years progress, never to be mentioned. As house swordmaster, Idaho mentors the Duke's young son, Paul Atreides. He trains the boy in combat, strategy, and valor. Paul has great respect for Duncan and describes his fighting as elegant and graceful, almost feline. Though the veteran Gurney Halleck may slightly edge past Idaho's growing renown, few others in the Imperium are as skilled with a blade as Idaho continues his practice. Leto, Duncan, and Halleck together sufficiently train a few regiments of Atreides' house soldiers to compete even with House Carino's formidable Sardaukar. And as the Emperor's dark schemes turn control of the desert planet Arrakis over in fief complete to House Atreides, Leto prepares his house for dangerous intrigue. The planet is a trap from which he can't flee, but perhaps break through with might. To this end, Duncan Idaho is sent with an advanced landing party to make contact with the Fremen, roaming bands of desert warriors native to Arrakis and purported to be the most effective and dangerous people ever known. Duncan embeds himself within the Fremen to learn their culture, to understand their thinking, and to ultimately forge an alliance that wins them over to the Duke's cause. For his part, Duncan's martial skill impresses the Fremen, and he's quickly accepted into their ranks. He acts as ambassador between House Atreides and the Fremen as Leto accumulates influence. But before sufficient strength can be gathered, treachery strikes House Atreides. The Harkonnens, with legions of Imperial Sardaukar for support, attack Arrakis and destroy the Atreides. On the night of the attack, Duncan, perhaps drunk on spice beer, perhaps drugged by another, is incapacitated and unable to save his duke. He does, however, follow a trail left by the Atreides' doctor and traitor Yue to an ornithopter, which he uses to escape alongside Paul and Jessica into the desert. Reunited with young Paul, and perhaps bearing a guilty conscience for his failure, he swears his oath of allegiance to House Atreides' new duke. Little does he know his service will shortly come to an end. The trio are pursued through the desert and waylaid by Sardaukar forces. The Ganaz Swordmaster, a legendary hero, springs into action and acts as the rear guard for Paul and Jessica's retreat. Duncan Idaho single-handedly does combat with multiple Imperial Sardaukar, fells nearly 20 foes before he is himself overcome and delivered into death's hands. Or is he? Conspiracy swirls around Paul Atreides in the years following his ascension to the Imperial Lion Throne. He is an uncontrolled power that threatens to destabilize the Empire's shadow factions, and so they move against him. A plot to silence the Kwisatz Haderach, the Mentat Emperor, is coordinated between the Spacing Guild of Steersmen, the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood, the deposed House Carino, and the bioengineers of the Bene Tleilax. Central to this plot is hate, a Gola of Tleilaxu manufacture. Golas in Dune are artificially created beings born in axolotl tanks from the cells, tissues, or complete bodies of the deceased. They are described by Bronzo of Ix as the flesh brought back from the dead, and later as humans grown from a cadaver's cells, innocent flesh devoid of its original memories. It's revealed that House Carino Sardaukar took Duncan Idaho's corpse from Arrakis, aware of the great skill within his muscles and nerves, and sent the preserved flesh to the Tleilaxu. What they create in their genetic vats is a ghost with the face of Paul's loyal retainer, eyes of metal, and the name of hate. In their own studies of the Kwisatz Haderach, the Tleilax learned that such an individual would commit suicide when exposed to philosophical and psychological positions that render them the opposite of what they believe themselves to be. The Tleilaxu Master Sightail, while in a meeting of conspirators, discloses that a creature who has spent his life creating one particular representation of his selfdom will rather die than become the antithesis of that representation. 8. The Duncan Gola is dressed as a gift to the Emperor who mourns the loss of his old friend but is intended for more sinister ends. 
trained in the Mentat arts of reasoning and in Zen Sunni philosophy by the Tleilaxu, hate is poison to Paul Atreides' mind, designed to plant seeds of doubt that will blossom into self-loathing and moral anguish to push the emperor towards suicide. If this proves ineffective, the Gola is mentally conditioned to kill Paul when the right words are spoken. An irresistible compulsion is etched deep within his subconscious mind. Beyond Paul, hate is meant to seduce and psychologically disarm Alia Atreides, a preborn with tremendous power in Paul's right hand. So it is that the Guild and the Bene Tleilax present this poisonous gift to the Imperial Court. How could such a plot escape the prescience of Paul Muad'Dib? Two weaknesses are made apparent. First, as prescient beings themselves, the Spacing Guild steersmen obscure to those gifted with future sight the happenings that surround them. Paul cannot see clearly what they plan. Second, Duncan Idaho represented a purity of character, a perfect man and loyal companion. His likeness is not so easily dismissed, a fact displayed in their first interaction. Send me away, sire, Hate said, and it was Duncan Idaho's voice, full of concern for the young master. Paul felt trapped by that voice. He couldn't send that voice away, even when it came from Agola. You will stay, and we'll both exercise caution. Hate performs his duties well. Like a terrible addiction with a far more deadly withdrawal, Paul is undermined by the ghost of Duncan, and yet he can't cast him aside. Throughout Dune Messiah, the Gola works the siblings Atreides over, turns them against themselves. All the while, the memory of Duncan is forever beyond reach. Golas possess the physical characteristics of their past lives, but none of their spirit or recollection. They are a blank canvas to be worked at whim. All attempts to resurrect genetic memory or past life have failed. As Hate himself states, I wonder if I'll ever leap inward to the root of this flesh and know myself as once I was. The root is there. Whether any act of mine can find it, that remains tangled in the future. In truth, the root can be found, but only through a trauma so powerful, it shatters the psyche. As the conspirators' plot reaches its climax, Hate hears the words uttered that trigger his compulsion to assassinate Paul. A great internal struggle ensues. The Gola fights with every fiber of his being against his programming, for he has buried within him Duncan's old morals and loyalties. One moment from plunging his blade into Paul, the Emperor speaks in a manner that evokes memories Idaho had of Paul's grandfather, the old Duke and man to whom Duncan owed everything. What must be done? Ah, that sounded like the old Duke. The young master had some of the old man in him. The words began to unfold in the Gola's consciousness. A sensation of living two lives simultaneously spread out through his awareness. Old memories flooded his mind. The triggered memory and the heightened emotional stake unlock for hate what had long been beyond any Gola. In an instant, his persona rushes back and Duncan Idaho is restored not just in body, but in spirit. The assassination attempt fails, but the discovery that Gola memories can be awakened will have great ramifications for the Bene Tleilax and for future Idaho iterations. With hate destroyed and Duncan revived, Idaho spends his second life in the service of House Atreides as their most loyal retainer. He marries Alia, and plays significant roles in politics and administration. When Paul's reign ends, the imperial throne stands empty. His twin children, Ganima and Leto, aren't of age to accede, and so a regency council forms. New intrigues swirl around court as various factions seek to control the empire's heirs. During this time, Idaho learns that his beloved wife has become possessed by a monster. Alia Atreides, in pursuit of power, allows the memory persona of the old Baron Harkonnen to take control of her body. This injustice throws Duncan into a rage. His personal history with House Harkonnen turns him against his wife, and he does all he can to protect the young heirs. No length is too great 
as Duncan displays in his final act. To win over the Fremen who follow Stilgar against Alia's forces, Idaho makes himself a martyr. Duncan rushes into Siege Tabor during a council and murders Javid, Alia's secret lover. To spill blood on neutral ground bears significant consequences, but Idaho goes one step further and directly insults Stilgar, which leaves the naive little recourse than to kill Duncan. The mentat within him knew self-sacrifice was necessary for the greater good. Again, to his last breath, Duncan remains loyal to House Atreides. But even this is not the last we see of the Swordmaster. The ascension of Leto II and his transformation into a great sandworm begins a 3,500-year tyranny as the god Emperor of Dune rules the known universe. Leto's prescience and other memories enable him to glimpse the golden path, the one road in infinite futures that ensures humanity's continued survival. Curiously, Duncan Idaho is a central figure in this path's paving, and the god emperor discloses as much. So begins a long line of Duncan Golas bred by the Exlotl tanks of the Beni Tleilax for Leto II's designs. Each Gola has their memories awakened in the fashion of hate, compelled to kill a face dancer likeness of Paul Atreides that conflicts with their strong loyalties. They are then presented to the God Emperor and appointed as commander of his personal guard of fish speaker warriors. But each Duncan struggles with emotional turmoil and the disquiet of his own nature. They learn of the Idahos that came before them and invariably each grows to loathe and oppose Leto. As this passage reveals, service is fractured with the realization that another Gola is being bred to replace the current Duncan. Leto knew why the Duncan was coming. Idaho had learned that the Tleilaxu were making another Duncan, another Gola created to the specifications demanded by the God Emperor. This Duncan feared he was being replaced. It was always something of that nature which began the subversion of the Duncans. A cycle of awakening, service, thoughts of betrayal, and ultimate rebellion ending in death endures for over 3,000 years of the God Emperor's reign. Many dozen Idahos are sacrificed to the Golden Path, only 19 of them dying from what would be considered natural causes in Leto's service. In fact, by the closing century of the Emperor's reign, the skill that once made Duncan legendary has become obsolete, his physical abilities replaced by generations of careful genetic breeding to produce humans faster, stronger, and more dangerous than Idaho in his prime. This warrants the question, why keep a Duncan Gola? To which there are many possible explanations. We know from the God Emperor's own vision that Duncan Idaho is crucial to the Golden Path. One reason for the endless line of Golos is that Leto prizes their morality. Idaho is a man of honor. He possesses an unwavering internal compass. The cost of humanity's survival is Leto's oppressive tyranny. His reign must be absolute. The Duncans act as a measuring device a tool to determine for the Emperor whether his rule is sufficiently reprehensible, as one Gola contemplates before an assassination attempt. This Imperium had wandered too far from the old Atreides' morality, had become an impersonal juggernaut which crushed the innocent in its path. It had to be ended. Only Leto knows the cruelty necessary for the greater good, and to see Duncan betray him despite the great sense of loyalty suggests he is still following the Golden Path. Another reason is that Duncan Idaho's genes will factor greatly in the continued evolution of the species. Leto's meticulous breeding programs have created masculine, dominant, and powerful women who stand as warriors and administrators in the Empire. Conversely, men have been genetically emasculated in a traditional role sense. They are docile and subservient. With such reversal in genetic characteristic, physicality, and temperament, Duncan Idaho is preserved as an artifact of what once was and embodies the perfect man, attractive and wild. Leto also plans for a mutation, 
a gene that veils an individual from prescient vision, a key to breaking free from future's prison. He succeeds in the birth of Siona Atreides, whom Leto then intends to breed with Duncan Idaho. The goal is overwhelming attractiveness and strong stock ensure their offspring will spread the Siona gene of invisibility to the Oracle wide and far into humanity's future. Leto also cherishes Duncan's integrity. He has within him the strength of character necessary to ensure the species survives Kralazek, the typhoon struggle at the end of the universe. It's profound that Agola, an artificially synthesized being, should manifest the humanity required to endure Kralazek. Let me know what you think of this in the comments. A final reason for choosing Idaho Golas is personal whim. We know that Paul Atreides, Leto I, and the Old Duke all live on as ego memories within the God Emperor. They all truly cared for Duncan, prized his moral fiber, and relied on his advice. It could simply be that Leto wishes to have near him a reminder of who he once was and the humanity he relinquished for the Golden Path. It's a Duncan Gola who, alongside Siona, ultimately kills Leda II and ends the God Emperor's 3,500-year reign. This action was all foreseen and planned by the Emperor. His tyranny was a pressurized crucible that, when finally released, allowed humanity to explode in an age of ingenuity and discovery known as the Scattering. The last Idaho Gola to serve the God Emperor has many children with Siona Atreides, her prescient veil is passed down through generations and spreads across the old empire. In the centuries that follow the scattering, the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood, long denied access to Leto's genetic manipulation, uncover the ruins of his breeding program and incorporate it into their own designs. They become the chief client for continued production of Tleilaxu Duncan Idaho Golas. The return of the Lost Ones from the Scattering brings with it a terrible enemy that threatens Bene Gesserit power. A radicalized sect known as the Honored Matries, descendants of sisters that partook in the Scattering, whose beliefs and methods have been corrupted by time, arrive with animosity and a desire to destroy the Sisterhood. Reports claim that they use seduction and sexual dominance to subvert authority and gain control of countless planets. They've perfected carnal ecstasy, and none can resist. The Bene Gesserit take this threat seriously, and a project is launched on the planet Gamu to turn a Duncan Idaho Gola into a weapon against the Honored Matries. The potential for another Kwisatz Haderach lies dormant in his genes. The project is precarious. We learn that 11 Golas have already been killed shortly after coming into Gesserit possession most by the very hands that supply them. External danger is compounded by internal dissension. Within the Sisterhood's ranks, there are those who remember with disdain the God Emperor Leto and abhor production of another Kwisatz Haderach. An excerpt between Reverend Mothers Lucilla and Shuangyu as they oversee the 12th Duncan's training illustrates the reserve. Surely no one believes this Gola could become another Kwisatz Haderach. Lucilla objected. Shuangyu began to speak, her voice almost a growling mutter. The designs of the project. They have a dangerous plan. They could make the same mistake. But many within the Sisterhood know Leto's reliance on Duncan Idaho Golas. No mere coincidence. He must factor into the Golden Path. From the age of six, the 12th Duncan is trained in combat by Miles Tegg, Supreme Bashar of forces loyal to the Bene Gesserit. Teg is himself descended from the Atreides line and bears striking resemblance to the old duke of the original Duncan's past. He is intended to awaken this Gola's memories. As assassination and intrigue spiral around the young Duncan Gola, he, Teg, and Lucilla must flee encircling enemies. It's while they hide that Idaho's pre-Gola memories come crashing into his consciousness, a clattering of lives and existences that impose themselves on one another in psychological turmoil. 
Duncan emerges from the experience with his past self restored, but something still remains locked. There were two lives, another Duncan felt incomplete. Something remained suppressed within him. The reawakening was not finished. And Miles Tag later observes that this Duncan did something new. He merged the pregola self with the vast knowledge his present existence had learned. But simmering beneath, thoughts yearn for escape. The Sisterhood suspected Tleilaxu manipulation of the Duncan Golas. Fearing they spliced false memories or instilled strong compulsions within him to further their own plans. It isn't until the end of Heretics of Dune that the full gravity of the Gola's nature is revealed. Duncan is captured by the honored Matries and marked for sexual domination, the tortuous pleasure that breaks wills and enthralls all to complete obedience. But it was precisely for an act like this the Bene Tleilax had programmed the Gola. They wished him to kill the Bene Gesserit sister that meant to sexually imprint him, not an honored Maitri, but the result is the same. Idaho's full genetic memory is unlocked to him. Not just the pre-Gola life of the original Duncan Idaho, but also every life of every iteration of Duncan Gola that has come before him. Each impresses itself upon his psyche, for he, is an amalgamation of cells taken from several Idaho-type golas. In essence, without undergoing the spice agony of the Reverend Mothers, Duncan Idaho opens the door to other memories and past lives. Rather than the knowledge of all his ancestors, he's possessed of all the knowledge of his own selves. He is the culmination of human understanding, morals, and character distilled over centuries into one being. He is another Kwisatz Haderach and more, one who might command humanity during the impending Kralazak and save the species. He proves immune to the honored Maitri's sexual wiles and instead turns their weapon against them. Duncan Idaho becomes indispensable to the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood, who wish not only to understand how he's overcome the Maitri's, but to study his consolidation of multiple selves. Wary of his abilities, the Sisterhood imprisons Duncan for ten years aboard a massive ship anchored on their central planet of Chapter House. During his confinement, Idaho displays many skills, including those of a great Mentat human supercomputer, the blistering speed and physical prowess of a superior human, access to his other memories, and most notably, prescient visions. In many such visions, Duncan sees two entities of overwhelming power and mystery, called simply Marty and Daniel. These two wield a weapon that transcends dimensions of space and time, known as the Net. Duncan fears his visions are of the outside enemy, the ones of many faces from whose wrath the honored Matries fled. In the climax of the War of Sisterhoods, the Bene Gesserit and honored Matries are united, and a new sisterhood is established. Idaho, Shiana Brug, and others wrest control of the ship and depart Chapter House, wishing to flee from the new sisterhood. Their vessels trapped, however, in the net cast by Daniel and Marty. Idaho's prescient visions allow him to see the weapon, and in order to cut themselves free from its tethered, he wipes clean the ship's manifest, data entries, and travel charts. This dooms Duncan Idaho to drift blind and listlessly in the unknown vacuum of space. Now, at this point, the original Dune novels run their course, and the story of Duncan Idaho is taken up by Frank Herbert's son, Brian, and author Kevin Anderson. Two novels are released to finalize the events of the Dune universe. Many consider these not true Dune canon, but they are worth explaining nonetheless. Duncan Idaho and all within the ship warp aimless into an alternate universe different from their own, within which they spend several years. Eventually, they're approached by a supreme entity of the cosmos, known simply as the Oracle of Time, who reveals their significance in the coming Typhoon struggle, and assists Idaho into making the jump back to their own reality. Upon their return, the crew discovers that the outside threat is humankind's ancient enemy, 
long thought destroyed, thinking machines, and that Daniel and Marty are the super AIs Omnius the Evermind and Erasmus. They have for millennia built a new synchronized empire of thinking machines far beyond known space. The lost ones of the scattering made contact and were ultimately defeated. Omnius has at its disposal an army of enhanced face dancers embedded into every strata of the Imperium, mimics that seamlessly emulate those they've imprinted, as well as countless thinking machines of war and deadly biological weapons. When Kralazek finally approaches, Duncan Idaho's true nature is revealed. He is the ultimate Kwisatz Haderach, a paragon of humanity who represents its best aspects. He has what no other Kwisatz Haderach had, countless of his own lifetimes of experience to improve and distill. He is the final iteration of the course of events, the perfect being. After Omnius is banished from this universe by the Oracle of Time, Duncan merges his superhuman essence with that of the AI Erasmus. Forged in adversity, Idaho's body unifies humanity and artificial intelligence. He transcends his species and becomes the new Evermind, able to empathize with both humanity and thinking machines. After eons of conflict, the grievances between mankind and its creation are redressed in Duncan, and he emerges as the all-seeing, all-knowing ruler of a new order which peacefully guides the species to its greatest potential alongside artifice. The future of the order is one where flesh and metal are united. So ends the tale of Duncan Idaho, the legendary Ginaz swordmaster of House Atreides, the Mentat philosopher Hate, the countless Gola iterations of his essence, and his final form in the ultimate Kwisatz Haderach. Within Duncan, we have a man of pure heart and steadfast loyalty, the essence of what makes humanity uniquely hopeful. Thanks so much for watching and listening. Let me know your thoughts on Duncan Idaho, which iteration you find most compelling, as well as your own insights and suggestions for future videos in the comments below. And if you're a fan of lore and storytelling, be sure to subscribe to the channel, check out the podcast where content is uploaded frequently. I want to thank my amazing supporters over on Patreon, who make all of this possible, and I couldn't do it without their fantastic support. If you'd like to become a lore luminary for access to me, a great community, written scripts, and early video drops, head to patreon.com slash thelorebrands to learn more. Until next time, go forth and explore the lore.